Welcome to this edition of History Tea with Professor T, and that T stands for Professor Tracy Daniel. And in this edition, we will be going over chapter 25 in your text, which is over the 60s. So this chapter, even though it's titled the 60s, the scope of the chapter is about 1960 to about 1968. So let's go ahead and dive in. At this time, John F. Kennedy is the president of the United States, and Kennedy's agenda at this time is to counter communism. Now we have to remember from your last chapter that we are just coming out of the Cold War. And so Kennedy's whole agenda at this time is to counter communism. He views the world through a Cold War lens. Remember that a lot of these eras in history are not necessarily concrete. They're more fluid. So one era will flow uh, to another era. So we're just coming out of the Cold War. We're kind of still in the Cold War during this time. And so that will help you to understand why Kennedy will focus, especially in the first few years of his presidency, he will have more of a foreign policy focus. Now, in 1961, Kennedy creates the Alliance for Progress, which was a multi-billion dollar aid program for Latin America in an attempt to improve the relationship. It was a Marshall uh, Plan kind of uh, type of program. However, it fails and it doesn't put as much money and resources um, like the Marshall Plan does. In April of 1961, Kennedy will allow the CIA to launch the Cuban invasion at the Bay of Pigs in an, um, in an attempt to overthrow, uh, overthrow Fidel Castro. So let's give a little background uh, for Fidel Castro, right? In 1951, Fidel Castro comes to power through an armed revolt against the Batista government. And the U.S. government at this time does not trust Fidel Castro, and they're wary of his relationship with the Soviet premier at the time, Nikita Khrushchev. So the U.S. does not trust Fidel Castro. And with the failed uh, invasion at the Bay of Pigs, instead of bringing the U.S. closer to Cuba and having better relations, it has the exact opposite effect. It pushes the Cuban government closer and closer to the Soviet Union. Now, in other parts of the world, in 1961, the Berlin Wall goes up. It's constructed to stem the tide of immigrants, and that is immigrants with an E, fleeing from East Berlin into West Berlin. If you are in my class right now and you have a copy of this PowerPoint, you'll notice I have a picture of the Berlin Wall as it was in the 1960s. And then I have some pictures of the Berlin Wall from 2022 when I had an opportunity to visit Germany. And there are parts of the Berlin Wall that are still standing even to this day, even though it doesn't look like it looked like back then. Now there's lots of artwork um, across the wall, but I digress. In 1961, the Berlin Wall goes up and it will not be de um, demolished until 1989. The Berlin Wall is a symbol of the Cold War in Europe. Now, in October of 1962, the U.S. Uh, US spy planes discover that the Soviets are installing missiles in Cuba, and that makes the U.S. really wary. And so Kennedy will impose a blockade of Cuba and demand the removal of these missiles in Cuba. Now, for 13 days, the world was on the brink of nuclear war. However, the Soviet premier, Nikita Khrushchev, agrees to withdraw the missiles from Cuba thus ending the Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay, now again, if you are in my class, you will see pictures of the Berlin Wall. Now, in the first two years or so of his presidency, Kennedy isn't really concerned with civil rights. Again, Kennedy is concerned about foreign policy. He is concerned about the Cold War. He is concerned about nuclear threat. So it takes him a few years to really focus on civil rights. According to some historians, they'll even say that Kennedy views civil rights as a sort of nuisance, right? So Kennedy will not focus on civil rights for the first few years of his presidency. But by 1963, the civil rights issues in the United States and not just dealing with black people, with black people, brown people, as we'll call in this era BIPOC, black indigenous people of color, are uh, rising for civil rights at this time. And by 1963, civil rights issues will eclipse a lot of his other concerns that he has going on. Now, why 1963? What is so critical or so crucial about 1963? Well, between, for instance, 
between 1962 and 1963, more than 50 homes, businesses, and churches are burned. And so in June of 1963, and we'll talk more about what happens in 1963 that will push Kennedy to, uh, to civil rights. We'll talk about that more a little later in the slide or in the presentation. In June of 1963, Kennedy goes on national television and he called for a law banning discrimination in all places of public accommodation. And this is just a snippet of the speech. He said, and I quote, we preach freedom around the world, but are we to say to the world and much more importantly to each other that this is a land of the free except for Negroes? So prior to this, Kennedy really shares J. Edgar Hoover's idea that the movement was inspired by communism. So it's not until 1963 when things really start to boil over that Kennedy will really speak on civil rights. And again, in June 1963, he calls for a law banning discrimination and all public accommodations. However, Johnson, or excuse me, Kennedy does not get to see any of uh, these laws take effect because in November, November 22nd, 1963, he is assassinated in Dallas, Texas. And so Lyndon B. Johnson becomes president. He was Kennedy's vice president. Kennedy is assassinated in November, 1963, and Johnson will become president. Now, after Johnson is uh, becomes president five days later, he'll put in some civil rights, um, some civil rights laws and civil rights uh, legislation. Now, during this time, you can feel that there is a change coming. There is a change coming in the environment. There is a change coming with laws that are passed, right? So in 1960, there's a law that comes down. There's a civil, uh, a Supreme Court ruling, excuse me, that comes down called Boynton versus Virginia. Again, that is Boynton versus Virginia, and this will come down in 1960. Now, Boynton versus Virginia, and this is very important to remember, will outlaw segregation at lunch counters, waiting rooms, and restrooms. The Boynton decision is an expansion of the previous Morgan versus Virginia decision, which was handed down in 1946. Morgan versus Virginia um, outlawed segregated bus seating, and uh, it outlawed segregation on interstate bus travel. However, in the South, both of these laws went completely ignored. And so you start to see protests that will come out of these laws, that we have these laws on the books that say that racial discrimination is unconstitutional, yet we are still facing racial discrimination. And so you'll start to see protests that will test these rulings, right? And college students are the leading force for social change. Again, I'll say this, college students are the leading force for social change. So anytime you think that I'm too young to make a difference, remember that during the civil rights movement, it was young people who were the leading force for change. And two of the organizations that were, I would say, the, the biggest organizations at this time were the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, pronounced SNCC, and the Congress of Race racial equality or core. SNCC was the mobilizing force um, of students for racial justice and CORE will launch the Freedom Rides. So what are the Freedom Rides? Who were the Freedom Riders? What is this all about? So in 1961, black and white core members took bus trips throughout the Deep South to protest segregated bus terminals. What they were doing is testing that 1960 Boynton ruling that stated that segregation of interstate transportation facilities, including bus terminals, was unconstitutional. So a lot of these Freedom Riders, they would board buses in the North and they would travel through the Deep South, okay? Now, the original group of 13 Freedom Riders were riding from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans. And everything in the states in the Upper South, they were able to 
um, ride pretty successfully. However, it's when they get particularly to the Deep South, um, specifically to Anniston, Alabama. Anniston, Alabama. They meet a mob of angry whites, of about 200 angry white citizens who end up following the bus. The wheels on the bus go flat. Um, and once the wheels on the bus go flat, the bus is actually firebombed. And when the fire uh, freedom riders come out of the bus, they are brutally beaten by police officers and by uh, members of the community, members of the public, mostly members of the public. Now, earlier I talked about uh, Kennedy not really getting involved in civil rights until about 1963. And I said I would talk more about what happens in 1963 later. Well, now that is that time. And we'll talk specifically about Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham was known as a citadel of segregation. It was a violent city. Birmingham was, in fact, so violent that it had a nickname. People called it Bombingham instead of Birmingham. They called it Bombingham instead of Birmingham because there had been so many bombings. Birmingham had more than 50 bombings of black homes and institutions since the end of World War II. Uh, local blacks really demonstrated, but there was not much of a result when they demonstrated. So let's talk about some things that happened in 1963, particular, particular in and around Birmingham. So in April 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. writes his famous letter from Birmingham jail where he explains the racial injustices that are being faced by black Southerners. This is what black Southerners go through. This is what black Southerners are. This is how black Southerners live. This is what we want. This is what we are demanding. So he pins his famous letter from Birmingham jail as it sounds like from a jail in Birmingham in April 1963. In May 1963, King leads a demonstration. Now, a lot of people will look at King and say, well, he he chose nonviolent protests. I don't understand it. But we have to remember that King was very aware, I like to say, of his angles. By the 1950s and 60s, most Americans have a piece of technology in their homes that is revolutionary. Now, at that time, it was revolutionary. We don't think about it as being revolutionary today. But by the 1960s, most American people, most American families had televisions in their homes. And King was very aware of his angles. So he led nonviolent protests, not just to show that we indeed are human and that you can beat us, but we will not beat you back to show our humanity. Yes, he did it for that reason. But he also wanted to show the nation, look at what we're doing. We're not even fighting and look at the violence violence that we are facing. Okay. So in May, 1963, King leads a demonstration, but what makes this demonstration different from other demonstrations that he's led before is that King uses young people. King uses young people. He uses, he brings forth the children and the teenagers in this demonstration in May, 1963. As they march nonviolently, they are attacked with fire hoses, they are attacked with nightsticks, and they are attacked by dogs and officials. And this is broadcast on national TV. So everyone throughout the United States and everyone throughout the world is able to see what exactly is happening in the American South at this time. Okay, now continuing on to what else is happening in 1963. In June 1963, the field secretary for the NAACP, Medgar Evers, was shot and killed in the driveway of his own home. In September of 1963, a bomb exploded at the 16th Street Baptist Church and four young girls were killed as they were attending Sunday school uh, for church. In June 1963, Michael Schwerner, Andrew Goodman, and James, K uh, James Cheney were kidnapped and murdered. So in 1963, it is particularly violent. You see a lot of violence on TV and it forces Kennedy's hand it forces him to act. 
Also in 1963, in August of 1963, we have the March on Washington, where you have over 250,000 black and white Americans um, who come together and demonstrate in Washington, D.C. The March on Washington was so significant because it illustrated this black and white cooperation for racial and economic justice. And it was led by A. Philip Randolph and a young man by the name of Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin was very significant in the civil rights movement. However, a lot of the time we don't hear much about him. He wasn't out in the forefront. He wasn't out in the open because he was an openly gay man in the 1960s. And so he was kind of kept in the back. He was kind of kept in secret. But he was the mastermind. Bayard Rustin was the mastermind behind the March on Washington. Now, Johnson, President Johnson called on Congress to enact a civil rights bill five days after Kennedy was assassinated. Again, he called on Kennedy to, or called on Congress uh, to enact a civil rights bill five days after Kennedy was assassinated. So when Johnson comes into office, his focus is a bit more on civil rights than Kennedy's was, but he will have his faults as well as we get uh, as we go later on uh, in the chapter. So by 1964, after Kennedy is assassinated and Johnson is in office, we see the Civil Rights Act of 1964 enacted. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibited racial discrimination in employment, public institutions, privately owned public accommodations such as restaurants, hotels, and theaters, and discrimination on the grounds of sex. However, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 did not address the right to vote in the South. OK, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 did not address the right to vote in the South. So that is the next thing that civil rights demonstrators and civil rights activists will try to um, manage. How can we get black people voting in the South? Right. And this is where we come to Freedom Summer of 1964. So SNCC or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, CORE, the Congress of Racial Economy and the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, will launch a voter registration drive in Mississippi. Now, they're met with violence. There were more than 35 bombings. There were numerous beatings, but they went down to try to register black people to vote. This campaign was led by the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Now, what is the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party? This party was created out of a need. With blacks unable to participate in the activities of the Democratic Party or even register to vote, the civil rights uh, movement in Mississippi created the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which was open to all residents of the state. Now, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party attempted to take seats at the all-white um, official party's 1964 Democratic Convention in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And Fannie Lou Hamer was the leading activist of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. I personally love Fannie Lou Hamer. She is famous for saying, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. Fannie Lou Hamer was born and raised in the segregated South, born and raised uh, or born to, uh, I believe, sharecroppers in Mississippi. She was poor her whole life. She had unfortunately been someone who experienced, as they called it, the Mississippi appendectomy, which is when uh, Black people and people who were seen as being perhaps um, less than were forcibly sterilized without their knowledge. Fannie Lou Hamer experienced that. But she led the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party uh, to get Black people voting in the South, which was something that was very necessary. And it led to the Voting Rights Act. So in uh, January of 1965, Martin Luther King launched a voting rights campaign in Selma, Alabama. So there are many voting rights campaigns going on throughout the South, throughout particularly the Deep South. And in January of 1965, Martin Luther King Jr. launched a voting rights campaign in Selma, Alabama. Why Selma, Alabama, we all think? Why would he choose Selma, Alabama? Well, in Selma, of the 15,000 black residents, only 355 of them had been allowed to register to vote. 
So on March 7th, 1965, King decides to, against the, I guess you could say, the permission of the governor of Alabama, uh, King decides to launch a march from Selma, Alabama to the capital of Montgomery, Alabama. And when they get to the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which was the bridge that led out of the city, they were met by police officers who had whips, tear gas, cattle prods, nightsticks and horses and, and all things of all natures. And this again was broadcast to the nation. So the nation is able to see these nonviolent protesters who are marching, who are just trying to get across the M.M. Pettus Bridge, and they are met with violence. And this is broadcast to the nation. When Johnson sees this, he asks um, Congress to enact a law securing the right to vote. And this is where we get the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 allowed federal officials to register voters, and we also get the 24th Amendment out of this, which outlawed the poll tax. Okay, now that is part one of chapter 25, and I'll come back to you with part two in just a moment.